choose uh, that year's distinguished lecturer? It's a great pleasure to introduce you know, to you this year's distinguished lecturer, Dr. Susumu Tanegawa. Uh, it's really a great pleasure. Susumu is a friend, a colleague, and an advisor. He's actually my science father. It was in his laboratory 23 years ago that I started my career in, in neuroscience. I came uh, in 1988, just uh, a year after he got his Nobel for Immunology. And the next three years, the three years that followed, were probably the most exciting years of my life. Well, at least so far. Uh, but anyway, back to Susumu. Susumu was, uh, was born in, in Nagoya, in Japan. Then he, he got his degree from, from Kyoto, his, his bachelor's degree from Kyoto. And he went to UCSD for his PhD, where he worked with Masaki Ayashi on, on transcription in phage. This was at the earliest days of prokaryotic genetics, and Susumu was in one of its epicenters. You'll see that this defines you know, Susumu's career, always being at the right spot, at the right time, when big things are happening in, in biology. After his work in prokaryotic uh, genetics, he went to Renato D'Alberto's lab, which is a factory of Nobel laureates, actually. <laughs> I don't think there's any other lab that ever rivaled the number of Nobel laureates that came from uh, from Renato's lab, and there he did work on SP40 and eukaryotic genetics. Uh, really run beautiful work there. Then he set up his, his lab in the Basel Institute for Immunology, and he tells me, and he told the students again, and he confirmed this, that when he went to Basel, he knew nothing about immunology, so he was surrounded by immunologists, and within a short period of time, he, he carried out probably what amounts to one of the most beautiful discoveries in the 20th century. Uh, he figured out how in the world can we generate millions of antibodies from a very finite gene pool. And he showed that through, through somatic recombination, you can use a small number of genes to generate uh, what seem you know, to be endless amounts of antibody uh, diversity. These studies also broke the one gene, one protein dogma, because he showed that he could rearrange genes and get many proteins out of it. Uh, this is the work that one of his, his Nobel, and uh, after Basel, he went to MIT, where he continued to work on immunology. Uh, there, he looked at the other side of immunology. So, first he worked on how you generate all these antibodies, then he, he worked how they work. And he cloned uh, uh, T-cell receptors. The gamma delta T-cell receptor is close to his heart when he was in the lab. There's a lot of exciting studies going on on the gamma delta. At MIT, he also discovered one of the first tissue-specific enhancers at the time. All of them are discoveries. He's actually the pioneer and founder of molecular immunology. And this is very significant because nowadays immunology is mostly in molecular cell biology uh, with a very strong emphasis on molecular biology. And this is really the, the, the role that Susumu had in the field. At MIT, uh, he became the first director of the Picard Institute in 94, when he radically changed his fields of study into, into learning and memory. And there he pioneered the new area of secrets, of, of genetics in the study of secrets. So, a Sumo's lab essentially developed a lot of technology, really sophisticated genetic technology, to dissect the function of secrets. And he directed this at the campus, where he has essentially been redefining even fundamental concepts of how the hippocampus is wired using really groundbreaking uh, uh, ground technologies, Sumo as discover new elements of what we thought was a finished field, how the hippocampus is wired, which is, which is really incredible. He also has done a series of studies that redefined and manipulated and essentially uh, rethought how we think of the engram. And that's really the topic of his talk here today. So Sumo became in, 19, in, in 2009 the director of the Riken Institute for Neurosciences, which is one of the world's foremost institutes of neuroscience, at the same time that he kept his Center for Learning and Memory at, uh, at MIT. He's currently director of the, of the Center for Neurosecret Genetics at MIT and, and director of, of the Riken Institute for Neuroscience. So it's my pleasure to introduce you know, to you the 2004 and 15 <laughs> uh, ICLM Distinguished Lecture. So, so
the reason why I changed the field from immunology to neuroscience is all uh, due to Alcina. Whether <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I succeed in this uh, career change or not, it all, uh, one way or the other, <laughs> it's a uh, it's responsibility. <laughs>
and has a tremendous impact to, to uh, neuroscience. Uh, however, uh, considering the modern knowledge about the neurons, uh, neural, neural connection called the synapses, as well as the circuits, neuronal circuits, the episodic, uh, epi episodic memory, for, uh, at least episodic memory, for engrams and uh, engram uh, bearing cells can be defined like this. So I talk within this framework today with this definition of engram and engram cells. So according to this definition, which I think is a very reasonable, reasonable one, certain populations of neurons, which is uh, which would be engram cells, encode information <coughs> extracted from an episode by being activated and undergoing enduring physical changes or physical chemical changes, which is called engram. Subsequent reactivation of these cells by stimuli that are part of the original set of encoded stimuli results in recall of the original memory. So memory we have the different phases. Where you may form the memory, something called the encoding, and also the second phase of consolidating the memory, and the third phase will be uh, to recall it. Okay. Um, now, however, since uh, that time of uh, <coughs> the past uh, 34 years, large amount of efforts. Uh, were uh, made uh, to uh, try to identify specific cellular ensemble that uh, can be uh, qualified as um, Ingram cells uh, and also uh, to uh, characterize the nature of this uh, postulated uh, physical chemical changes in those cells. But it's been very difficult to do it. But uh, many work were directed not to the embryo cell ensemble themselves, but to the brain regions, the region of the brain, relatively broad region of the brain, like hippocampus, uh, cerebellum, and so on, broad region of the brain, uh, which may be necessary, which may contain embryo cells. Okay. So, the uh, question is how can you uh, really uh, identify? Uh, memory engram cells, specific engram cells for specific memory. And for that question, uh, some neuroscientists have uh, proposed uh, the certain conditions uh, for, for, for this. For instance, this one here, which was uh, quoted uh, from um, uh, Martin and Morris, uh, published in 2002. The final test of any hypothesis concerning the memory engram must be a military experiment in which apparent memory is generated and also expressed artificially without the real requirement of sensory experience. In one sense, such an experiment would constitute a practical demonstration of the fact that we really do understand how memory works in the same way that a successful engineering feats are valid our hypothesis about the nature of the physical world. Another person who made some statement uh, related to this is uh, uh, Sina Jocelyn, uh, much later 2010, so I think that it's called from her, something like this from her uh, review. A direct test of memory engram theory would require specifically labeling only the neurons involved in memory formation, memory encoding, and then subsequently reinstating memory recall by reactivating those neurons. Um, as I said, this, because of the insufficient uh, technology available, 
until recently. Uh, this uh, has not been possible. So, in a few years ago, I think 2012, uh, a couple of people in my lab tried to uh, attempt uh, using to attempt to reach this goal using some combination of some technology. I will not go into the detail of this because the paper has been published in 2012, it's already three years ago. But I mentioned a little bit because it, this, uh, this identification of human cell is crucial for the subsequent uh, discussion. Uh, some of them are unpublished work. So three essential tools were used for this purpose. The first is a method to label the neurons activated by learning. So cells have to be activated by learning for, for, it, for, for them to qualify as memory embryonic cells. For this, we use what is called CFOS uh, promoter, one of the immediate early gene promoter. It's not known that, for instance, in the campus, immediate early gene CFOS is activated when a go goes through uh, training, uh, memory training. The second is a method to target uh, this railway to the time window of the encoding of the specific memory as opposed to other memory. And we use for this what is called DOCS, DOCS cycling uh, mediated uh, induction system. And the third method is to directly <laughs> reactivate the specifically labeled neurons uh, subsequently, and for this purpose, as uh, some of any of you know, we use the channel reduction. So, at the behavior paradigm, we use a very standard one for rodent. It's called a contextual fear condition. So, this is a rodent version of power of uh, practical condition. So, you place mouse in a chamber, which uh, provides what people, let's say, we call this context B and the left animal memorize the feature of that uh, context. And then you give a mild foot shot to the mouse. And the uh, mouse uh, will, be, in this case, the conditional stimulus uh, will be uh, content E, and unconditioned stimulus will be a foot shot. Then mouse quickly memorize this context, this chamber, is a very dangerous place. And the next day, you put the animal back to the same chamber, context B, then the uh, animal will express fear uh, by, by freezing. On the other hand, if you put the animal to another chamber, which is very different from the chamber in which animal will uh, shot, then animal will, will not freeze. So that's the paradigm, simple paradigm that we use. Here we have a method to identify memory engram cells. And uh, I go this very uh, quickly, briefly. So what is shown here is a mouse brain. And uh, this is a transient class in which uh, the tetracycline activator, the tetracycline uh, affected uh, transcription factor, uh, expression is controlled by a uh, CFOS promoter. To this mouse, we inject a uh, virus, which is made up with here. Uh, TRP is a uh, uh, TTA uh, recognizing uh, short DNA sequence, and uh, round screen is a channel of option to gene, which is good to uh, YFP, and that's a virus, so you can inject this and we focus on all the giants of the hippocampus in the initial set of experiments. And at the same time, we implant the optic fiber also to a dirty giants. Okay, so that's the setup. You, go, you grow the animal uh, in particular context, context A, in the presence of doxycycline. Okay. So if this doxycycline will block activity of uh, TTA, uh, nothing will happen. Now, you, on the day of experiment, you shift, shift the mouse from context A to context B, very different context. 
เดินทางอยู่ในมูตกสไตล์ตรงนี้ลองดันตายนั่วเอ็นซิโอ้ยจะอันอันนี้ยูเกิร์ดแบบนี้คือคุณชอบคุณชอบอันนั้นเอ่อเอชีฟอสต์ว่าจะอัพเทเวเกตแล้วเดี๋ยวคุณชอบมาดอกซินจะอยู่ในสเปรสอินโอลิโดเซลล์อินเดนติจารุเซลล์อ่าวิ่งอินวิชิพอสอ่าอ่าที่จะอัพทูเบย์ now next day you put back and go back to the cycle in positive diet also change the content from B to A now A is so different from B and I mentioned that in the area of cartoon animal will not freeze then however if you shine blue light to uh the digest Uh, area where putative population, cellular population, ensemble, if the uh, label with a channel adoption, uh, question is whether can you uh, induce uh, behavioral recall of the animal. In other words, is the uh, cell which is labeled here, is the active reactivation is sufficient uh, for inducing memory recall? And the answer is That is true. That is the case. So again, this is the procedure, and what is shown here is the y-axis is the freezing, and x-axis is off. Mean the light is off, light on, off, on. This one is about three minutes, and uh, you can see here. You can look, look at the kind of E when the light is off. Uh, <coughs> this is the wrong context. I know not what means, but if you turn on the light. And activate the uh, putative syndrome cell in the dead child. You get a substantial bleeding of animal, and this is reversible. You turn off the light, then they stop bleeding, and you turn on again. Okay. There's a bunch of control experiment here, uh, which is crucial, but I'm not going to the detail of that. And we'll go on to the next step. So this just summarize for you. This uh, is the essence of this uh, experiment. Uh, immediate RNG she force combined with the optogenetics can tag to a label neurons, then they get granular the cell that are activated during the memory encoding for later manipulation. Artificial light deactivation of these, these putative memory temporal bearing cells <coughs> is sufficient for behavioral memory recall. For contextual clear condition. <coughs> Now, so we remember according to the uh, definition, we have to demonstrate these putative memory neurons by themselves. Those are deactivation, deactivation leading to memory recall. We have to show those cells have really undergone enduring changes due to due to this uh, training. Okay. So we characterize these embryonic cells. Embryonic cells are labeled with a channel of dots in white P. So you can look at it. If you kill an animal, make a brain slice <coughs> or gamma slice, you can look at it under a microscope. It, 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 it's green. And it only a few percent of the entire dendritic life running cells. Because they are so all the proportion of cells that are activated by specific <coughs> memory inducing uh, procedures. So, do embryo cells show LPP type structural plasticity? The first question was: Do embryo cells show structural plasticities uh, in their synapse, like a like a growth of our spines, or maybe even generation of new spines, which has been speculated to be more to underlie the memory formation? Speculated, but have not been demonstrated. Is there, is, if these types of plasticity are there, uh, have they been dependent on the protein synthesis? Uh, so this is another uh, 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 hypothesis or uh, claim that has been made, and we want to test it directly by looking at uh, behaviorally defined, genetically defined memory embryo cell ensembles. And for this purpose, You let animal go through this uh, uh, training, uh, as indicated here. 
uh, on dot, on dot training, on dot 24 hours later. So you give a so-called consolidation period here, and then you kill the animal, and takes the people, you make uh, okay, for slices here. Okay? In doing so, we have labeled uh, Dentigyrus uh, cells, just like I described, with uh, uh, TRE in chain. We are not going to do behavior in this experiment, so we don't need to uh, uh, put channel dots in here, but it's still uh, express, they are labeled uh, with M chain. The upstream is the internal cortex, which provides input to uh, Dentigyrus, Dentigyrus uh, uh, putative uh, endome cells. And that one uh, received a virus, another virus, which is campaigning to specific uh, promoter channel adoption EYFP. And you make a slice, and you can see that some cells uh, is uh, MCD positive, which indicate it's an ingram cells, and some other cell right next to, well, not right next to, but nearby is MCD negative. So this is the putative ingram cell, this is the putative non ingram cell. I mean, this uh, green is, is, uh, is, is, is the fiber coming from endocrine cortex. And you can see here, uh, you do the uh, uh, double uh, patch clamp uh, recording for engram cells and the non engram cells. As the uh, endocrine cortical input uh, is activated with the uh, blue, blue light. Okay? And you can see what happens to uh, synaptic strength. And one way established to look at the step synaptic strength is uh, to take the alpha MMDA receptor <coughs> ratio. Okay? So when uh, synaptic strength ratio goes down, <coughs> because the alpha receptor is, all, is, is moved into the, in the, into the postsynaptic spine. And you, you can see here, this is the angular positive cell uh, that's a uh, uh, level of uh, uh, ratio, the green one, and that next to it, this is the engram negative cell. There's a significant in increase. Well, the significant, uh, uh, the, yeah, you can say <laughs> increase by having engrams. Okay? Uh, now, I didn't explain to you, there's another group of mu group mouse in which uh, after shock, right after shock, well, we add protein synthesis inhibitor for the anisomycin. And it's been shown in, uh, in uh, many studies about it that uh, anisomycin will block for so consolidation of uh, uh, memory. Okay? So they record, it causes amnesia. 24 hours later, you test the memory, and then animal will not show the memory. In, according to the, uh, what uh, many people uh, thought that in the group of uh, uh, animals, uh, with the slice made out of them, and if you have information right after shock, then uh, memory will not be consolidated, and uh, LTP type uh, phenomena should not uh, take place in those cells, even in those cells <coughs> labeled by by chain. And that is exactly what we found. So no difference between this, uh, the MCHERI, MCHERI, uh, positive or negative cells if anatomizing is added right after uh, shock or shock. We can also look at uh, plasticity, uh, the structural plasticity of uh, synapses, spines, and by uh, counting a number of uh, spines, under these conditions. Okay, so uh, again here, this is really just an example, and it's changing uh, in injected in the, in the control uh, animals. The uh, animal positive cells have a great, significantly greater the, uh, spine density compared to animal negative cells. Uh, in the anisomycin treated one, that increase is dropped. <coughs> This is what one would have expected according to what everybody thought. So there are nothing surprising, except that I think it's the first time 
that rather than just a population of uh, from area of the brain, like uh, the, the giants, uh, rather than that, or by looking at the only those cells which are really labeled by uh, training and which have good activation has been demonstrated to lead to remembering it for the first time those cells actually undergo the uh, synaptic uh, plasticity of both efficacy as well as the structural uh, plasticity. So, so that's great. That's what we expected. But uh, surprise came in the next set of experiments, which is a behavioral <coughs> experiment. Okay. So as, a, as usual, you have an animal here, yeah? context A is grown, and then you put the context B uh, without, without oxycycling, you know, it is a brand to me the oxycycling is not in the diet. So the, uh, the cell, uh, any, any cell which is activated by learning, by training, would be labeled with the channel of oxygen. And you have two groups of mice, uh, one which is uh, receive or receiving uh, right after training, and the other receive and the mice, as usual. Okay. And then the next day, uh, you uh, do the test one. So in the context B, so the natural cue is provided for the code, so the control animal should be, and the uh, uh, mice uh, added animal should be Okay. But next day, uh, and that is the case in here. It's a controller animal, uh, shows 30% freezing, but anisomycin uh, uh, treated animal uh, shows very reduced uh, freezing. Okay. They are accommodating. However, next day, uh, you activate with the light, artificially activate uh, those cells which are labeled. Uh, during during this uh, uh, off period, okay. and uh, you do this uh, top of off on right off on off on experiment. So there are two line, two dot lines here. One is the control, the other is information treated mice. See, you can see it. Uh, there's no difference. And the animal breathes perfectly okay as long as embryonic cell labeled cells are activated. Uh, and this is despite the case that uh, this amnesia is maintained. In the next day, you look at the uh, with a natural cue, and information uh, to be the animal uh, is very much impaired in terms of memory recall. So this is not expected. This is not what we expected. So if this is true, you have to say that uh, MTP like uh, protein system dependent LTP at the end of the uh, at the end of the, the, the uh, consolidation period is not necessary in order to uh, hold the memories. And that's what we have to say. Since this was so uh, unexpected, we decided to vary various conditions of our uh, behavioral experiment. And I show you only three cases, uh, although we have a few more cases. And one case, which is a uh, still context of air conditioning of our line, but we manipulated, labeled and manipulated, deactivated only CA1 engram, putative engram cell, a rather than dentate giants. And you can see here, uh, and with and without animals. And you can see our media in here, and it is maintained on the day three, but in between, if you activate, uh, light activate, they go to cell, you see the light, light of dependent uh, memory expression. Number two, we change not only the area of the brain which is uh, manipulated, but also we change the, uh, the condition, uh, pure conditioning to tone pure conditioning. Tone pure conditioning to campus, uh, campus independent. Uh, so the memory is formed in lateral amygdala. So we manipulated the lateral amygdala, uh, lateral amygdala of the engram. And you can see this is a partial, but still significant amnesia here. And but if you go to the official particular activation of lateral amygdala engram, then the memory is there. Okay. 
third one is, uh, this may require a little bit of explanation, but uh, in, in any case, uh, we go back to the context of air conditioning and also when it comes to the digital gadgets manufacturing. But instead of consolidation uh, amnesia, we looked at what is called the big consolidation amnesia. Okay? So it's a complicated procedure here, but in any case, at the end, Reconsolidation is uh, blocked in an amnesia mouse, but memory is uh, perfectly there if you uh, use uh, artificial activation of the central cell. So, uh, with all these uh, additional data, we are uh, persuaded, we are convinced that uh, whatever, however unusual uh, these data are, that they, they must have uh, some truth in it. So let me summarize this part of our uh, um, data. So in a normal condition, no anisomycin. So here the dendritic gas uh, runs itself. Uh, here, here the input coming from my environmental cortex. And uh, after uh, the um, uh, under normal condition, without anisomycin, uh, after cons memory is consolidated, the synapses uh, are uh, very much strengthened and memory density is also high. And when a recall review comes from the, the data of the test, uh, that pure information will go through the synapse and the lead the soma, and then that where the reactivation of cell takes place. Action potential will be generated and right here, and therefore behavior recall will be found. In anisomycin conditions, if you have anisomycin right after training, okay, uh, as I said, as I showed you, the synapse does not get uh, augmented. Synapse strength does not get augmented. Okay, it's shown here by small, small red dot dots compared to this one. And when they are tested with a recall view, natural recall view, recall view cannot go into cannot reach the soma uh, for action potential generation because the synapse uh, strength is so weak. And therefore, you get a uh, amnesia, no recall. However, in the same condition, if you directly activate uh, the soma cells here, okay, not, not relying on the transmission through synapses, then uh, you can activate the action potential and therefore the other behavior um, Now, big question is, what well, if there is no LFTP, or no LFTP, and, um, how do how do cells maintain memory information? In what kind of mechanism is a subservient to holding of a memory? And uh, sort of hinted by actually Head's original idea. You know, Head said there are two cells which fire together actually get connected, wired together. Okay? So he would not really saying that the synaptic plasticity, augmented the synapses, individual neurons. Is, a, is, 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 is not how memory is with information is stored. It's saying that the uh, connectivity of uh, uh, cellular, uh, multiple cellular ensemble, which are connected, that connectivity changes, increase of the connectivity, uh, is the one which may be holding the memory. So we tested this hypothesis by going back again we find what a little unusual. Now this time the difference is the basic data diagram is uh, actually labeled with channel adoption DYMP. And the downstream CA3 area was uh, also labeled but without channel adoption with MJ. Okay? And now we now went through this uh, training and uh, labeling procedures. And then after this is done, uh, you have uh, CA3 and cherry positive CA3 engram cells uh, and the CA3 non-engram cells. You poke these cells 
uh, with the electrode and see what fraction of the cell, CA3 embryo cell versus non embryo cell, respond to the uh, activation of upstream dentigitis embryo cell. So it's an embryo cell, embryo cell connectivity we are talking about. And you can see here, nearly 80% of CA3 embryo cell in a controlled animal will respond. And only uh, maybe uh, 20 some percent of uh, non embryo cell, CA3 embryo cell, will respond to the activation of an upstream embryo cell, in the virus embryo cell. And in the anatomically treated animal, there is no difference. And this is consistent with the idea that uh, the delta virus embryo does have uh, the memory information stored there. And it is a connectivity uh, that is maybe serving without LMTP uh, for, for memory recall. And this can be also uh, shown not using a physiological method, but by taking advantage of a C-force expression as a measure of activation of the cell. So it's a bit of a complicated experiment, but you go through the same procedure. Except in this case, they are dead uh, <coughs> in cells are labeled with the channel of adoption, and the CHP cells are also labeled, and also uh, <coughs> DNA cells, part of downstream amino cells are also labeled. Okay. Three embryo cells are labeled in this case. Okay. And then after that, you test uh, this animal. Uh, by, by, providing, uh, by providing a natural cue in a context B, which is where, where the uh, training occurred, or by uh, activating a dentate gyrus embryo cell, upstream embryo cell, uh, with blue light. What is shown is, in the CA3, let's talk about the case of the CA3, and we can talk about the CA3 later. These are the cells which is uh, embryo positive cell in the CA3. Okay? And these are the cell, green cell, and the one which is reactivated as a result of acti as a result of activation of uh, embryo cells uh, by natural cues or by particular activation of upstream uh gyrus embryo cell. And as you look at the, the uh, over of the cells, uh, in the original embryo and the reactivated cells. And you can see here uh, the, the result uh, like that, and uh, there are much, uh, much more higher level of over if found if you use a natural cube. Okay? And if you use anatomizing, then this is greatly reduced. Not as low as uh, the random, uh, what you would expect from random double label, but it's still significantly reduced. If you use uh, artificial activation uh, by light of the anti-gyrus embryos, whether if anatomizing is present or absent, you get the same level of overall, which is also similar to the natural things uh, overall. And that in the CSV, and you can look at it further down the screen of the APA, and the basically you get the same result. So this is also support the idea, connectivity between uh, upstream embryo cells and the downstream embryo cells is the one which is maintained uh, uh, by, by training uh, in, uh, in the presence of anthomycin. So, I would like to summarize this part of our uh, work uh, by, going, by, by going through uh, key points. Embryo cell ensemble or embryo memory are organized in an embryo cell pathway or embryo cell circuit. In this case, Dendigan, CSV, and amygdala, either way. Could further down. It could also go further down if you analyze it. Preferential connectivity between embryo cell ensemble along the embryo cell pathway may be a crucial substrate 
or store of memory. It's a connectivity, the potential connectivity of neuron cell ensemble from stream to downstream, which, uh, which provide memory, retention of memory information. Neither MLTP type synaptic plasticity nor structural spine plasticity is necessary for the consolidation of memory. Because without it, we can induce memory before artificial by activating neuron cells. These types of plasticity may instead be necessary. This type of plasticity we're talking about here may be necessary for memory retrieval, as I mentioned with the cartoon earlier. Around before we choose to reach the cell somas. However, the support, the retrieval, rather than storage the cell we call on each. Now, this is a big issue which has been debated among neuroscientists for many years. And people, some people say this is dead wrong. When you have a means of treatment, if that be called damage of uh, memory carrying cells, or if that be because uh, media uh, is generated by inability of people to, to activate the healthy uh, neuron cell. And our data support actually is a uh, retrieval theory, which is actually most of people actually believe in storage theory. So this would be a, a supporting a minority, minority of people in a uh, neuroscience community. So we'll see how they react. Um, now, I want to spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so uh, by uh, talking about uh, what we can do by engineering these memory neuron cells. Now that we, are, we believe that uh, our cells, what I'm, what I'm calling neuron cells, satisfy all the three requirements uh, of memory neuron cells uh, as uh, dictated by the definition I give you, Cells have to be activated by them, and cells have to undergo uh, enduring or persistent changes, and activation, reactivation of those cells is sufficient to uh, induce behavioral memory recall. And I think we have satisfied those. So now we can use this engineering technology and address interesting, several interesting uh, questions about running in the memory. One is creating a force memory. I will explain to you in a minute. Second is to switch in the memory valence. And the third is attenu uh, attenuating or attenuating depression with a positive memory manipulation. So let me go through one by one. Uh, so now memory, we, we believe most of the time, memory is very reliable. Of course, sometimes we forget something or get confused, and we may get into the argument with your friends and family members and all that. But uh, normally, we do quite well. However, it turned out, it's been long, for many years, among psychologists, that under certain conditions, we make terrible uh, mistakes uh, in remembering something that happened to you earlier. Is called Forbes memory. Okay. When the DNA test was introduced about 20 years ago, there was a big survey of inmates in the state of New Jersey, uh, where this is a big of the inmates which been in prison uh, for heavy, very heavy crimes, and they chose the cases where the witness testimony played a major role in the bulk. And we looked at by DNA test, bearing uh, the person's DNA and the DNA which could be extracted from the crime site. And according to this uh, particular survey, uh, which is published in here, there are three out of four cases the DNA didn't match. Okay. That doesn't mean that all, uh, all, all of the, uh, the uh, three four of the people are innocent, it doesn't mean that. But there could be other complicated issues, but it's a big proportion. Now, this, now the problem of false memory uh, is that uh, there is a little bit of 
animal model of false memory. It's not even clear there's an animal form for this memory. Right? You might have human hands on the side of human shapes. So we wanted to make model, mouse model of false memory by uh, testing uh, this possibility. Yeah. Okay. Could the false memory be created by an association of recalled memory of the past experience, uh, which lives in one's mind at this moment, and using that as a CX, so you are recalling something you did, uh, I don't know, uh, one week ago, while you are listening to my talk. And I'm going to give you some of UX, okay? So you are, possibly you are associating uh, the uh, recalled memory of the past experience, which has nothing to do with this uh, today's uh, uh, event here. And um, associate that with a concurrent external event of a high variance as the UX. And then, of course, that would be the false memory. And the uh, question, so, so we could do this by uh, engineering in ourselves, and this is the principle of the big term. And I go back to the background information a little bit about context of your condition. A1, animal is exposed to context A, as usual. But no shock. Day 2, put shock is delivered while animal is context B, not in A. So, B peer memory is formed, but no, no A peer memory will be formed. Okay, this uh, doesn't include any uh, of, 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 I mean, optogenetic manipulation yet. So this is the real experiment. They want exposure, animal, exposed animal to context A under docs of conditions, to label with the channel adoption context A memory engram. And then next day, uh, move animal from context A to context B and they give a shock. But uh, under the condition where, uh, so this is the dog's on here already, so the context B engram will not be labeled but in the presence of right activated context A engram. So in other words, when you give the food shop, you also give a blue light, so that the context A engram, which is labeled yesterday, will be activated. So this is the equivalent to animal is remembering yesterday's context A memory uh, while they are being given the high variance event in the food shop. The question, could the context A peer memory be formed? despite no simultaneous exposure to context A and the food shock delivery. The animal was never shocked in context A, but the animal may treat uh, in context A. And the answer is yes. And I want to go, I'm not going to know the detail. So the context A memory is uh, um, labeled here. Uh, with, uh, with no doxycycline in diet, and then I will go through the control exposures in a context B, uh, shock is given, but also in one group of animals, the uh, context A engram is right activated. Okay? And then afterwards, you test uh, the memory against the uh, neutral context C and also the, uh, the, the experimental context A. But you can see this is the only case where you can see a significant amount of the indicating animal uh, associated uh, context A in run, uh, with a shock. So uh, animal never uh, show, show the uh, context A specific uh, peer memory, despite the fact he was never shocked in context A. And this uh, is a uh, it is more complex here. After I'm going to go through this, you put the mouse to another contact called contact D, which is very different from ACB, and then uh, you give a light, uh, you give a, a blue light, uh, or not to give the blue light, and you can see here that there's a light specific reactivation of false memory. That different is shown in here. So the false memory like a real memory. Um, so, from this uh, conclusion of 
Core's memory arm, which are not activated from digital memory in RAM, and data data can stop not only other artificial CS, which I showed in the earlier uh, part of my talk, 44, but also the CS for an implantation, what is my student called this inception. Inception of the Core's memory. Creating the Core's memory. The uh, false memory, real memory, is a real memory, like the activation of false memory. In the memory itself, the data is sufficient for behavioral report of that false memory. Now I want to move to another uh, question, the second uh, part of the engineering And uh, it goes like this. You know, the template is very good for historic memory. But, uh, the current memory doesn't necessarily come away some kind of balance, positive or negative balance. You just go, some, go into some room in the studio for a while and you memorize the feature of that room without any kind of specific uh, positive or negative uh, uh, energy. So how do the HPC, hippocampus neural cell encoding neutral component of episode interact with a neutral neural cell? Encoding emotional component from the same episode. Yeah, amygdala cell are known to uh, 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 encode the emotional aspect of episode. If there are emotional aspects, how flexible are the interaction between hippocampal circuit, neuron circuit, and uh, uh, amygdala neuron circuit? So, in order to do this, we prepare a usual variation of what we can describe. Four different groups of them. Uh, two of them, uh, the entire syndrome is labeled. Okay. The other two, uh, BLA, the amygdala cell, Ingram uh, is labeled. And for each one, at the US, you use either foot shock, which will generate a fear memory, and the other one, you use a, a pressure experience. How do you give a pressure experience? Is mice are called main mice. So you let the main mice spend one hour with a female mice. <laughs> <laughs> that is the pressure memory. So you can give two by two uh, 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 the situation here. And you can see here all these cells are more or less similarly labeled. Similar to a similar extent. Now, uh, then you measure, you actually monitor the uh, effect of fair memory conditioning or pressure memory conditioning by putting an animal uh, in this rectangular box, which is to uh, turn around so that you can see both sides. And there are two components, as you can see here. The animal can freely move from one, one side to the other side. But the every time animal come to one side, one particular side, then you give blue light. Okay? So blue light, if the fear memory uh, acquires fear condition of the animal, blue light will activate the fear neuron, and therefore animal won't, won't, won't like it, so they will run, run to the other side. Okay? So if you can look at the proportion of time animal spend uh, in like it, uh, Compartment, uh, compartment versus non negative compartment. And uh, with, without propor proportional differences, you can tell whether the animal has a fear memory or not. The same thing here, uh, in, in, in this, uh, if animal have been given the pressure conditioning, animal like to stay there because if he remembers the, the good, good experience they had, and they would rather stay there. And uh, so you subtract the proportion of the time difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so what is called, this is the result of uh, this case of uh, fear conditioning, and this is the pressure conditioning. And here the testing. And uh, what is plotted here, the different score. Different score is the proportion of time animal spend in lightest compartment, compartment minus animal spent in the other compartment. So for the fear condition animal, the different score becomes negative. So you can see the negative value here, indicating the, 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 the animal 
mouse in this case, we use not the mouse, but the uh, mouse which has accumulated the not too negative experience in people. Okay. So example of that is actually in the human, it is the one who can wait to the uh, um, patients have uh, this uh, problem of uh, the uh, series of negative uh, experiences, for instance, by chronic stress. So depression uh, patient is thought to be like that. Okay? So can one exploit the various switch of the memory by internal cell manipulations to attenuate, at least attenuate, but to reduce, mean, and uh, diminish the stress in the patient related behaviors. Uh, these behaviors include the case of mouth. There are several other kinds of behavioral tests for depression like uh, the uh, behavior has been established. And one is called the tail suspension test. So you hold the animal with a tail, and a uh, normal animal will struggle to try to, to, to climb up. But, uh, uh, Highly uh, <coughs> depressed, depression like uh, mouse will give up. It is, so you can just count the number of times, the number of uh, the seconds that the animal struggles and see whether the animal has any uh, problem. Hopefully, the challenging situation. Another is the inability to experience to see our pleasure to for the performance. And this can be done by any kind of healthy animal. Uh, to give a choice of superfluid or versus uh, regular water. Okay. And uh, what we show here is that, in fact, uh, so this is, the uh, oh, by the way, for the stress, chronic stress, we do, we do a terrible thing to mice. We use uh, what is called film wrapping. So you wrap the mouse, except uh, not, not the mouse, and uh, for like a uh, few, few hours, a day or 10 days, continuously. I'm going to get uh, very stressed. And they show depression by the frame of time, as indicated in here. So tail suspension test, uh, you see that this is uh, the time struggling uh, in, in this test. This is no, no stress animal, this is a stress animal, the difference is very significant. Sucrose preference test also shows, uh, obviously, Stress is bad. And in fact, uh, the, these animals also show anxiety like behavior, as indicated here, which is measured by open field test, the uh, generated plasmic test. Uh, now, question is whether if you let animal experience auditive memory first, okay, and label those cells as usual, and then this is just a control. And then I let the animal go get the stress, stress. And uh, then you get test. I mean, you, when you test, you uh, activate positive ingram cells, positive ingram cells in, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus uh, in such a way whether the, the core of a, a nice uh, data experience he has will reduce the, uh, the depression by phenotype. So there are a lot of controls here, but the important point I want to uh, point out is that uh, the, this is the thick line, this yellow or orange line here. So this is right is off and right is on. So this is the only case among several different cases here where the light uh, will help animal to spend more time struggling. Okay? And so is the sucrose preference. This is the only one who has shown the right of dependent changes in, a, in the preference, increase of the preference. Interestingly, I'm not going to be much detail, anxiety-related uh, uh, behavior does not seem to be affected. Can <coughs> with uh, artificially activating or positive ingram cells. Now, uh, Steve wanted to uh, point out and the deep rescue conditions are uh, what part what part of the uh, angle that is brain is involved you know, in helping to for animal to uh, reduce uh, the uh, 
depression like a phenotype. So he did a, a brain-wide analysis of uh, uh, activation of cells as animals go through uh, this uh, uh, behavior with a light, light activated synthesized uh, animal. And he found, uh, I'm not going to go all the detail, a particular nucleus of shell and also uh, hippocampus, uh, the, uh, amygdala, PLA or central amygdala uh, cells show hydrocarbon sucrose activation. So this suggests that uh, uh, from hippocampus to you know, multi synapse uh, <coughs> pathway, go to the, the BLA, and the BLA to the hippocampus cell may be helping for animal uh, to get a rescue or uh, depression like uh, uh, behavior. And in order to confirm that, uh, he did a very sophisticated optogenetic experiment. In this case, you labeled uh, the giant signal cell with the channel of dots. Okay? At the same time, you label BLA engram uh, with HT, which is now to inhibit activity of the cell. In the same animal, animal go through this uh, entire procedure, but uh, you like activate channel of the dendritic animal cells with the blue light here, but also you activate the animal uh, cells, which is labeled with uh, negative HT uh, proteins, but only in potential type of BLA cell, which is the common cell. So you label, you don't label, you don't illuminate here, you don't like here. To breathe back in the So, this is the data, this is the table suspension data, and you can see here when the, the light is off, both are off, then the animal show a uh, short struggling time because the animal is stressed. Okay? And uh, if you uh, put the uh, light uh, on, uh, then uh, you get increased struggling time, but increase is blocked if you at the same time. Uh, activate the patronal terminal of the PMA in a nucleotide canvas, okay? because that expresses HT. And the same similar result can be obtained the sucrose preference. So from this data, this data, we can come up with this uh, circuit, similar <coughs> cell circuit, start with a uh, uh, hippocampus, uh, and the jazz, fragile VCS, VCA1, and we go into a cortex, and it goes to the DNA, and eventually it goes to the carbon cell. These are all cells that are activated by, by line, and uh, they are, this pathway uh, plays uh, a crucial role in uh, restoring or diminishing the, uh, the behavior uh, which is related to uh, <coughs> depression. So, Concept, the important concept here is in the cells, uh, memory is not just stored in one area of the brain, but there is an in the cell pathway or circuit. And their connectivity, their preferred connectivity, as I mentioned earlier, is the one who is uh, supporting the memories. And I, I think I skipped this and uh, so I can make. So I just summarize. Uh, was I said overall. Building uh, that granular cell population identified by the sheep option or production labeling technology fulfill the multiple criteria for memory membrane cells, which include they activated by learning, they show learning induced enduring changes, they are sufficient for the report of the specific memory form reactivation. And they are necessary. In fact, this last one is not our work. It's a day uh, at all. It's a published paper to a year last year in a hand drum of Columbia. These hand cells are also necessary for the report of this specific event. Among the real changes, MMTP type synaptic plasticity is not, apparently is not necessary for memory retention, but seems to be important for memory retrieval. And uh, finally, 
uh, for each memory, multiple engram cell populations form an engram cell pathway. Learning dependent establishment of preferential connectivity between multiple engram cell populations along the engram cell pathway seems to be crucial for memory retention. A typical manipulation of engram cell allows an inception of the false memory a switch of memory variance and attenuation of depression behavior in mice, uh, providing implication for the future development of a new therapeutic method based on the genetic manipulation of hormonal ensembles. So that's all I want to say that I want to acknowledge uh, people who did that. It's work, it's work. Uh, People on the left side are the major um, contributors. On the right side is more uh, technical people. Some of them are actually postdocs who help the uh, people on the left side. So that is our collaborator. I have to tell you something very sad. Okay. This guy, Shuru, who pioneered this work in my life, he started this whole thing. And he accomplished a lot. And uh, recently, uh, he died. So I want to dedicate this lecture and paper to the publishing now that accepted uh, to show the period that takes a truly talented uh, young uh, person, young scientist, but also extremely generous. So all these work, he developed all this technology, different writings, and then we get to understand that he left everybody in the lab to use it and to let them do the thing they wanted, which I described in the summer. So, uh, what else? But well, anyway, Steve Ramirez is my experiencing student. I think it would be very young if he left a few years ago. Uh, but that was a very uh, amazing uh, stop. Roger Redondo, Josh Kim. Josh Kim is a graduate student. Uh, Otomo are parents. They did this in our class. Their switch experiment. Thomas Ryan, he has grown. And Kim, 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 and again, Otomo. Pilots uh, were instrumental in more recent work, which, is, as I said, is not published yet, but uh, about the transformation of these immigrant cells. So, uh, I want to mention all the people on the side. So, thank you very much.